All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin, and I'm here with Novage Marketing Strategist, Aurora Meneghello. And we both like to welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar series episode. Aurora, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you, Kevin. And welcome, Chris. I'm excited to be here today. Thanks, Aurora. Awesome. Okay. So I just told you guys, and you attendees probably heard this before we started recording, um, I, to amp myself up for today's webinar, I dug through YouTube to find an incredible introductory video from Archicad Monkey uh, showcasing Artlantis back in 2010. This is 2010, okay? And, if, you know, I looked at the postcard feature to the speed at which Artlantis was able to work, and I got to say it was amazing. But this is 2010. What can it do now? Um, who better than to show us an Objects Online General Manager, Chris Stringer, uh, who will be here today to give us a quick overview of Studio 4.1 and focus on shaders along with the various ways that we can use them. Uh, today's webinar presentation will be about 40 minutes long and afterwards we'll have a brief live Q&A session where Chris will field questions from those attending. Chris, if you'd like to say hi to everybody, uh, that'd be very nice Absolutely. Of you. <laughs> Hello and welcome uh, to the webinar. And uh, it's a, really a, a pleasure to have everyone here. And uh, Kevin, you let me know when you've passed the ball to me, so I should start uh, <laughs> paying attention to my screen. I will let um, you know for sure. Um, but, uh, okay, fantastic. Yeah, so <laughs> I, you know, I'm very excited to be here. This is, uh, I think, the second uh, webinar I've done for No Veg. The first one was kind of a dud because we had some some uh, transmission issues. Uh, mm. There was a real serious lag on the video feed, but uh, I think we've gotten that problem taken care of. With I think so too, because you're working on a MacBook now or something. So yeah, I've got a little faster machine and uh, <laughs> we've got things optimized a little better. So I think we're going to be in good shape today. Cool. And uh, so yeah, uh, Artlantis 4.1 uh, is uh, the tool we're going to be talking about. I am the general manager of uh, Objects Online, as uh, Kevin mentioned, and uh, we are the Advent uh, distributor here in the U.S. and Canada. So we work with Novage as a sales partner, and they are uh, integral to our success. And they have a fantastic web presence. I'm really, uh, really, it's a thrill to work with them because uh, they really they get it as far as uh, uh, what it means to be online, what it means to reach out to people, what it means to build a web-based community. Uh, to create a you know, web-based excitement about products. Cool. Um, and I think that is due in large part to uh, you know, this webinar series and other resources you put in place. So I think you know, I really commend you for doing a fantastic job to, uh, to build up a strong uh, uh, design-based community with uh, the products you're selling and representing. So cool. thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, thanks Chris. Yeah. Um, so if you guys don't know who Chris Stringer is, as he has mentioned earlier, just now, he is the general manager of Objects Online, and he is an Ivan Arlantis distributor in both the U.S. and in Canada. Um, Chris Stringer is trained as an architect, and he is involved with the sales, training, and support of all things architectural software related ever since 1996. I don't know what I was doing in 1996. Let's not explore that. So, if you don't know, we're really pleased to have Chris Stringer here. So, uh, you know, he's broadcasting all the way from Florida. So on behalf of the attendees, thank you for joining us. Okay. So, but before we get going, this is the NPR part. Before we get going with the presentation, here's an overview of what we do at NoVeg. So the NoVeg webinar series is brought to you in part by NoVeg.com. As one of the largest online design software stores, we offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Atlantis Studio 4.1 for Windows or Macintosh or M Mac, uh, it is available in both Canada and the United States from us at NoVeg as a digital delivery with zero sales tax. Now, if you're interested in picking up a copy of Atlantis Studio 4.1, feel free to contact our sales representative, Bob Thayer. Uh, he can be reached by email through bob at noveg.com. Aurora, I think you have some words to share about Vector Working and our blog. Yes, as Chris mentioned, we have a large online presence, and one of the things we're very proud of is our Vector Working community. So you can join the conversation of Vector Working. It's our community to discuss the latest industry-related news and find the answers to your questions. And of course, anything about our plant is in that community as well. Don't miss this opportunity to interact with other like-minded professionals and sign up today. With that, you will receive a weekly newsletter that Kevin right here actually puts together. 
And we also have a blog, and that twice a week, every Tuesday and Friday, we publish new interviews with artists and innovators. <clears throat> so check it out online. <clears throat> In our next upcoming NoVeg webinar, episode 70, 100% independent and authorized Rhino trainer Maya Merov Holtzman of Design Rhino will be joining us to showcase Rhino 5's capabilities to design and create and she designed her own line of jewelry using Rhino. Maya is amazing. She also uh, was here at Novage uh, for some in-person workshops and she's a great trainer so I invite you all to check it out if you use Rhino. For more details you can visit our webinar page on novage.com webinar 17. So thank you Kevin. No worries. Uh, thank you Aurora. That was amazing. Uh, so just a heads up, if you have to leave at any time, if you have dinner for some of you guys who are living in Scotland, um, <laughs> today's webinar will be recorded live. So if you want to rewatch episode 69 in its entirety, as always, you can find it on our NoVeg webinar series channel through Vimeo and YouTube. Uh, with that said, Chris, are you ready? I believe I am ready. Cool. I will switch presenters in three seconds. So attendees, if you have any questions at any time, please share them through the chat window. I'll be surfing that part of the um, uh, program. <laughs> gotcha. There you go, Chris. Have fun. Okay. All right. Show my screen. Okay, here we go. So, um, yeah, I said I was ready, and then what happens? Uh, my little intro crashes. We'll wait for that to come up, but I'll just start talking, and... and uh, if we don't get the uh, uh, thing to pop up here, I'll just move right into Artlanis. This is supposed to be about Artlanis anyway, not about uh, PowerPoint type stuff. So, but it's pretty light on the PowerPoint anyway. It's just to kind of show you the topic. So, um, you know, today's uh, focus is going to be on Art Artlanis, obviously, and the shaders capabilities of Artlanis. So, uh, we're going to talk about. Um, uh, different kinds of shaders that are in Artlanis, and uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, texture-based versus uh, uh, just procedural-based uh, shaders. Um, we'll talk about the shaders inspector and how that's set up in Artlanis. We'll talk about the shaders catalog and how that's used. Um, I'll go into uh, how a person can manipulate some of the shaders in Artlanis to achieve uh, some common things that you're going to likely be doing with Artlanis a lot if you use the software. Um, and I'll talk about how to set up a custom shader uh, so that you can do more than just use the stock shaders that are included uh, with Artlanis. And I think that's really critical to your success with Artlanis is to be able to take it uh, above, above and beyond what's uh, inside the box and, and uh, you know, start creating things that really uh, are expressive of your, your ultimate goals uh, as an illustrator and slash architect. So, um, with that said, I'm going to check real quick on this presentation and figure out what's going on with it. Okay, I'll do a quick click of that and see if I can open it in the other option I have available to me. I think it's there. One more shot. Okay, it is working, so we're good. All right, so yes, yeah, Artlanta Shaders. Um, and Objects Online, as I said, is uh, the... Uh, distributor of Artlanis. Uh, we do sell Artlanis, but we would encourage you, uh, those of you visiting today on today's webinar, to absolutely uh, work with uh, Novage on your Artlanis purchases. They do offer a substantial discounts, so it's absolutely worth it to shop through them. Um, but where they don't cover certain products, we do. We have a lot of Artlanis media that uh, isn't up on Novage's website, so uh, we can kind of cover both bases for you if you have needs to go above and beyond what's included uh, within Artlanis and uh, the products that are sold on NoVeg's website. So um, I'll skip past the contents since we already talked about that. And uh, we're going to go into uh, our model and start um, looking at that. So this is a model uh, that is of a chalet. And we're going to just jump right in here and start uh, working with the, uh, the shaders and materials in Artlanis. So by default, when you uh, open a model in Artlanis, you basically, first of all, first step is you're forced to open something in Artlanis. The first time you launch Artlanis, you're greeted with an open 
file dialog. Artlantis is not a modeler, it's a renderer only, uh, rendering an animation tool. So therefore, you have to start with something, content from somewhere, some other 3D modeler, and pull that into Artlantis. So you know, we have a model that was modeled in some other uh, software, and uh, we are now ready to start dressing this up. So we're going to see uh, off, right off the bat that there are material assignments that carried over from the modeler. Um, so these orange colored roofs are different than the cream colored walls that are different from the uh, brown wood members and so on and so forth. So those are material assignments. And here on the left, this is the, uh, the shader inspector. And we can see a list view format of the, all the materials that are in this model. And uh, so um, as we uh, you know, hover over and click on a surface, um, that is going to automatically highlight that shader or that material in this materials list. Uh, so if I click on something else, you'll notice at the list on the left, it jumps down to that material down there. So um, it's very easy to kind of work between these two um, modes and get things done rather quickly in Artlantis. So um, anyway, so this is the shader inspector. Again, I'm going to be referring to it quite a bit. And this is sort of your command central in Artlantis. You can access it from the inspector menu in Artlantis. And we're going to focus really on the shaders um, inspector today primarily. Um, <clears throat> so um, what you're seeing here uh, is the basic information about the currently selected or active shader. And it's uh, showing you uh, information about color, reflection, shininess, and so forth. Each shader has its own different parameters. And there are different kinds of shaders. So you're going to see slightly different layout uh, depending on what type of shader you have selected. Um, so I'm going to uh, pull up the uh, catalog, which is kind of floating behind this window. Or you can access it through this little button here in the, in the top bar. Um, and this is our catalog. So this is our interface for visually referencing the shaders that are available in Artlantis. And I'm going to primarily today focus on the shaders that are included by default in Artlantis. So that would be this list um, in this folder here, uh, the shaders folder. And then there are, of course, a number of third-party shaders, as I mentioned, that we offer. And Novich uh, has a few as well. Um, but let's start with this A surface folder. That's going to be sort of your your basic go-to uh, category for a lot of the shaders you're going to use, things like metals, and uh, concrete, and uh, reflective surfaces. Um, geez, this is just kind of your standard go-to place, water, glass, and you know, those sorts of things. So you're really going to use this one a lot. And there's a, really, uh, a lot of nice, really good textures in here to uh, select from. So uh, what I'm going to do, um, we're going to start with this roof, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some, one of the cool new features in our Atlantis 4. Um, and we're going to find, uh, we'll, we'll skip out of this uh, A surface folder and go down to the uh, roof tile um, family of shaders. And I'm just going to select one that I like. And one of the awesome things about Atlantis, and Atlantis you have to understand is fine-tuned to be fast, easy to use, quick to learn, very fast at rendering, and to offer a real-time 3D preview environment. So as you're doing stuff in Artlantis, you're, you're, things are happening very, very quickly. So I'm going to try to be conscious of the folks who aren't familiar with Artlantis and uh, try not to go too fast. But basically, a lot of things happen in Artlantis just through drag and drop. So I'm going to select, for example, this roof material right here. Uh, and I'm going to drop that onto the roof surface. And uh, as quickly as that, I have applied a roof material to that surface. And everything that had that material assignment uh, from the 3D modeler you know, is carried through into the 3D model and, and now has that uh, shader assigned to it. So I've taken what was a shader definition from the 3D modeler and applied a shader to that surface. So the shader has additional information, additional controls above and beyond what the standard or default shader would have. Um, so we can do some really cool stuff with this. For example, uh, it used to be kind of an issue in Artlantis. Uh, you know, manipulating roof surfaces could be tricky because the uh, orientation wanted to line up kind of in the direction that it was dropped, and so you'd have to go through and select a bunch of different faces to change that. Well, now there's a new uh, orientation option in uh, the material settings that enables you to choose this horizontal orientation, and instantly, you'll see in the preview window, all of the roof surfaces are aligned horizontally the way you would expect shingles to, uh, to stack up. 
So that's a great feature, and it's a real time saver compared to the way that things used to be. And it's, uh, I think, one of the really hidden uh, gems of Artlands 4. You know, just one of those things that you just smack your head and go, "Wow, this is fantastic!" So uh, it's as easy as that to do that sort of thing. Um, let's move on to uh, um, from that. Uh, I want to talk about um, uh, the uh, some of the other um, shaders in Artlantis and uh, uh, in, that are in the default uh, shaders category. Uh, I did briefly touch on the A surface, but there's other really nice shaders in the bricks and carpets. Um, there's different coatings gravel surfaces and lawn for uh, landscape type applications. Uh, we have flooring uh, surfaces and pavers. And there's quite a few of them and you need to scroll down if your window's small like mine. Um, roofing tile, wall tile. So there's a lot of different options in there. Uh, but we'll also be talking about ways you can customize things. Um, so by default, Artlantis includes uh, about uh, 185 high quality shaders in this uh, this catalog here um, and there are also additionally um, included in Artlantis uh, a number of uh, 3D objects. There's over 200 3D objects and billboard objects which are flat photo objects so you've got both 3D options and flat photographic options if you want to really speed up your renderings with uh, for example photorealistic plants or people. Uh, you can sometimes choose the billboard option as a good way to, to uh, cut down on your rendering time. Um, so, uh, and there's also a set dedicated to, uh, of shaders dedicated to the Maxwell render engine, which is something new in Artlantis 4.1 uh, that came out uh, last year that we're really excited about. This partnership between uh, uh, Advent and uh, Next Limit Technologies, uh, who are the makers of uh, Maxwell Render. Uh, so you've got built built in. Now Artlands is no slouch at rendering. It it does a very good job uh, at doing photo photorealistic rendering. But Maxwell Render is sort of top notch uh, uh, rendering option. So you have access to that um, under the uh, licenses in Artlands. You can activate the Maxwell Render engine if you've purchased a license. It does require separate licensing. So if you're curious about that, um, check out the Melveg website and. Uh, order a copy of that to run inside of Artlantis. You really save a lot of time. The benefit there, of course, is the art, you're working in the simple Artlantis environment to do a lot of your work, uh, but you have the benefit of that powerful Maxwell Render Engine. Hey, Chris. Um, um, I, I just want to interrupt because so, uh, I have a yes, question sir. from Jose, and uh, it's relevant to what you're talking sure. about right now. It's a nice one. It's only for roof shader, or does it work with any shader? Uh, it, it works with any shader that has the orientation, which I believe is pretty much everything. Um, so... If you set up and apply an Artlanta shader to a surface, you're going to see orientation as an option. And horizontal is just one of the orientation options that, that are available to you. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, um, in addition to uh, uh, you know the, the default media, there are, as I said, a number of other uh, media options. I'll just quickly open up and just show you the list of all the different volumes. There's, there's quite a few. These are all the 3D objects. There's tons of people, cars, plants, animated people if you're into Artland Studio and doing animations, furniture, various sorts of all-purpose objects for populating a scene with stuff. <laughs> so you, you really got a lot of options there. Um, so you know, I'll quickly uh, make mention of uh, where you can preview uh, these uh, these additional uh, volumes. If you go to artlantis.com and navigate into the products and click on the media, this is where you can browse through these different volumes and preview them. So if you click on the view CD-ROM contents, uh, which uh, I'm going to do right now, it's going to pull up a thumbnail catalog of all of the um, uh, shaders that are contained in this volume. So that's a real easy way for you to uh, decide before you buy whether this is something uh, that's going to suit your purposes. So I'd encourage you to check out artlands.com. I'd also, of course, uh, encourage you, uh, if you need more than uh, what is available on Noveg's website, let me point out exactly where um, the shaders are, or actually the uh, 3D objects are on Noveg's website right here. And you can also, I think, drill down through um, uh, products by brand, so Advent or Artlands. You can go either way there, and I think you can also find some additional uh, volumes uh, listed that way. And then uh, just to point out on objects online, in our Artlantis category, we also have a number of uh, additional shaders that aren't on Novich's website. 
and uh, there's also a number of third-party options that aren't published by Advent that we also put out there as well. So just a quick pitch for that. Let's get back into our Atlantis and uh, carry on with the uh, presentation. So this window here, I'm glad this popped up because I may have forgotten to mention it. This is the 2D view. You can navigate um, using a 2D representation. Uh, you can switch to different orthogonal views of your model. Uh, so you know, I'll make a quick mention of that before jumping back into the 3D. Um, so one of the uh, nice uh, features that was introduced in Atlantis 4 is I'm going to switch views to a swimming, swimming pool view of this chalet. Uh, <clears throat> try not to ogle too much the people in this scene. We're really uh, talking about uh, the uh, uh, design of the space here and what we can do with that. So I'm in the, uh, in the Shaders Navigator, and with that active, I have the option to uh, right-click on this surface here. Now, you notice this surface came in uh, from the uh, modeler as kind of a monolithic surface, so in other words, a uniform single material. Uh, well, we know water belongs in here. We know that there's probably going to be a different material uh, surrounding the pool, and then this uh, pool deck is probably also going to be something else. So that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, we could individually uh, select um, these surfaces and uh, assign material, reassign uh, the proper materials to them, but there's actually a faster way to get at that. And I'll show you. You just right-click on the material, and if it's possible, it will split that material by mesh uh, so it's a thing that cannot be undone, but it, it really is, it's a good thing you want to do this um, because it's going to give you some, some great options. So now uh, what I have here, if I click on these surfaces, it has split these materials by the mesh that originally existed in the 3D modeler. So now I have the ability to assign materials uh, directly to those surfaces without having to do a whole bunch of work splitting out those polygons. So that's, that's really a another fantastic time saver that's introduced in our last four. I'm going to go into the uh, general surfaces here, and I'm going to drop in this uh, Fresnel water shader. Fresnel, there's a number of different Fresnel shaders in Atlantis, which is a fancy way of saying uh, you have some additional control over the way the, those types of surfaces handle reflections. Um, so I'm going to apply this uh, water shader to the water surface. I'm going to drop this mosaic shader onto the uh, liner of the pool. I guess that's the proper term for it, or the tile surface. Uh, let me go into um, the pavings here, and I'm going to drop uh, just one of these surfaces onto the edge of the pool. And at any point in time, you can see this is kind of oriented diagonally, so I can go in here, and if I hold down the shift key, I can constrain uh, the angle onto 15 degree increments. So if I want to choose a 45 there, that'll orient this uh, texture in there properly. And then if I want to uh, zoom in here, I can do a scroll wheel operation to get in a little closer. And I can actually click on that material. And you can see the cursor has changed to an icon with some arrows so that I can now drag that uh, texture or that surface um, on the surface there and align it a little better uh, the way I want to. And then I can flip back to my previous view of this camera and uh, continue to dress up the scene. So I've got... Also then, uh, let's, let's dress up the, uh, the deck surface here. Let's go down to um, our wood surfaces here. And uh, I'm going to drop this uh, planking texture on here. OK, so now we have uh, what looks to be a little uh, more of an inviting uh, pool party going on here. And so now, um, thanks to Split the Mesh, this only took a, a, just a, less than a minute to get all this stuff uh, done, and it would take a lot less time if I weren't sitting here yapping. So <laughs> that's a great feature in Atlantis, and I hope you're able to use that uh, when you run into situations like this. <clears throat> um, so uh, let me talk about uh, one of the great features that I think uh, really uh, Kevin had mentioned that he uh, was in love with, and I'm in love with it too because it's really a good feature. It's the postcard feature in Atlantis, and there's uh, in your... Uh, Catalog. Uh, just to quickly point this out, by default, what you're normally going to see when you install Atlantis is the images folder, the objects, the postcards, and the shaders. So the postcards has its own dedicated little uh, family here. Uh, and you'll see the default um, postcards that are set up in here resemble these little uh, chip samples, like materials you might get from, uh, let's say, a linoleum supplier or something like that, kitchen uh, surfaces, that kind of thing. Um, so these are things that were set up uh, by Advent that you can just uh, readily use. And uh, the idea behind 
uh, the postcard is um, it's a shortcut to using preset materials in our Atlantis. Now, what makes it different than just going into the shaders uh, list and, and choosing a shader there is, like I said, these are preset shaders. So in other words, you've gone into a, an existing shader. You've made some modifications to, let's say, the size, the orientation, the reflection, the, the shininess, so on and so forth. And you've come up with a shader that you like. So now that you're going to apply that into your, um, into your uh, project, and how are you going to get that uh, shader back? Because if you go back to the default shaders, it's not going to be configured to your specs. It's going to be set up for the default shader settings. So uh, <coughs> Postcards offers a way for you to uh, basically create a list of presets. And um, so let's, uh, let's just kind of go through that and show you what can be done. Uh, so basically, a postcard is a small uh, JPEG file, and uh, what you do is you um, let, let me just make some material assignments. Um, for example, uh, I can just click on any surface in this um, palette here, right on the image, and drop it in onto any surface I want, just like as if it was an actual shader. So it's grabbing the shader. Uh, definition and any presets that were uh, not presets but customizations that were assigned to that uh, from this image. Now this is basically just an image that was saved out of Artlantis. This was a project file at one point and then they saved that uh, that view as a postcard and now any material in that view can be dragged and dropped onto any material in this scene. So you can quickly change uh, around the surfaces to uh, something of your choosing. So I could go here and maybe assign a, a brick surface to this wall or, or whatever I want. <clears throat> so um, let's go back and do a, more of a plain kind of coding. Okay. All right, the screen blacked out. I hope that uh, refreshes itself. Yes, that's much better. Okay, so um, now you can, you know, once you've uh, gone through and customized a view, now remember, uh, few minutes ago this scene looked totally different so we've we've come in we've modified this model and you know maybe we're happy with these materials at this point we want to create a, po a postcard of our own so we can do that by going into the tools menu and select create postcard and it's going to give us a little dial that pops up to save uh, this new postcard that we're uh, about to create and so I just give it a name and then I save it, and I, I, I would suggest going with the default save location, which is going to be inside of the Artlanta Studio program folder, uh, or if you have render, the render program folder, and in there is a media folder and postcards. So that's where postcards should normally be kept. And if you want to give it, a, you know, it names it by default after the view, whatever the name of the view is set up. Uh, so, you know, if you want this to be uh, uh, something related to your project, you might want to throw that project name in there, so when you look at this later, uh, by name, you'll be able to easily um, uh, recall that, it, oh, yes, this was associated with such and such project, and this was such and such view from that project. Uh, so you can refer to it by name, or you can refer to it visually by browsing uh, the postcards in the uh, catalog browser. So let me go ahead and save that postcard, and now that should pop up uh, in my list of postcards somewhere. I just have to find it. Uh, this is, uh, where is it? That's this one right here. This is the one I just made. Um, so now I can click on that, and I've got all those settings uh, saved in that image. Uh, like, for example, I could take this water surface and apply it to something else, which, you know, that's a little strange. So, <laughs> but you can do strange things if you want to. Um, so we'll drop something a little more appropriate back onto that umbrella. So, um, so that is the, uh, the basic idea uh, behind postcards and how they're created and how they're used. I will kind of reinforce some, some of the main concepts of postcards back in this uh, presentation. Um, so postcards, uh, first and foremost, are a way to keep uh, palettes of your favorite shader settings. So you can just set up some generic uh, sample chips and maybe a, you, know, you set up a little project with a bunch of square tiles or something like that. You can just drop a bunch of materials on that. So that's one way to use postcards. Uh, another way is to, you can share postcards. Now these are JPEG files, remember. So you can pass those JPEG files on to other people. You can put them on other computers. You can do whatever you want with them. Um, 
and that information is retained in that postcard. So it's a way to uh, share um, material settings between different projects or between different collaborators in your office or elsewhere if you're collaborating outside your office. You can share the postcard file and those shader definitions that you've set up, that you've taken the time to laboriously set up and customize, are now you can freely distribute with uh, your friends and associates or you know, uh, down the road in future projects. Then one other uh, good application is you can, uh, for example, set up a series of postcards um, that uh, talk about different uh, color or material schemes that you could potentially sit down in front of a client. Because Artlantis is a great real-time renderer with that preview window, you can actually have a meaningful conversation in front of a client, navigate through your model, drag and drop textures from your saved postcards and change things at will right in front of the customer or right in front of your client and uh, you know have a, a focused meaningful conversation you know at that stage of the process if that's something uh, you'd like to do. Okay hey Chris so, um, 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 yes, interrupting sir. question uh, okay so Jose wants to know uh, a postcard can be moved from a PC to another can that be done and would you need to have the same shaders in both computers? Yes, and that's one of the caveats I was about to mention is there's a few <clears throat> things you need to be careful about with the postcards. Um, go back into Atlantis here. First of all, um, uh, the postcards are contained in, uh, like I said, in the media folder in the postcards subfolder of the media folder. So good idea just to keep them there. When you pass them along to somebody, they should put them in their postcards folder. You don't want to mess with the name of the postcard file. You don't want to open it and edit in a photo editor or anything like that. Just drop it in, leave it alone, and let Artlantis do uh, what it needs to do with it to use it to, to, you know, for all that it's worth. So it's you know, basically a JPEG file, but it's got special information embedded in the JPEG file that uh, Artlantis uses. And if that in any way gets changed, then it messes up uh, Artlantis' ability to um, use that as a postcard. So that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so, uh, and I, I can't remember if there's anything else I wanted to say about that, but you can, of course, go in and overwrite a postcard, too. So if you modify a scene, uh, you can go in and overwrite a postcard, uh, say with the same name, and, of course, do that if you need to. So if nothing is permanent, you can always make changes if you need to. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's move on to um, talk about some of the shaders in Artlantis. We'll focus uh, a little more on you know, some specifics. So let's go back into the shaders and uh, I'm going to try to speed up my pace here a little bit. The water uh, shader in Atlantis, I'll click on the surface. Now, again, when I click on a surface, it highlights that material, and this one has a shader applied to it. So I'm seeing the shader settings for this water uh, shader. So let's go through and kind of pick this apart. Um, the transparency is what uh, gives this shader both its color and its level of transparency. So if I double-click this, uh, this uh, color box, now, you're going to see some, a little something different on Windows if you're in that environment in terms of the color palette. It just goes by whatever is available in your system. Uh, so I've got some options on Mac for color wheel and uh, s s sliders and things like that. So let me just pick a color, um, and we'll pick kind of a bluish tint maybe. Uh, now, the darker the slider goes, uh, the more um, blackness you introduce into the, sh uh, into the uh, color, the more opaque that water surface is going to become. Okay, so that's important to know. Usually water is going to be pretty uh, mostly clear, um, you know, unless it's a pond or something like that where there's a lot of stuff in there. But uh, So it's going to you know, be on the lighter side of things usually, especially if it's a pool. Um, so we can give it a blue tint or, you know, we can just keep it at a white tint. Let me drop the saturation out of this and go back to white or sort of light gray. So that becomes a, an almost nearly transparent, almost completely transparent, um, white-colored water. Reflection is, is basically, well, I don't want to skip uh, the, the options here. These are refraction options for um, the water shader. So right now it's set to water, which gives it an accurate sort of refraction. So the line on this corner here is getting bent. It's almost hard to see because the, of the waves on the water. Let me drop those back. Uh, maybe you can see a little more clearly. So right now it's really kind of uh, warping what you're seeing in the water. If I switch to air, which is basically no refraction, you can see the difference uh, between the two. Um, <clears throat> reflection, we can go in, same concept with the transparency, the level of darkness is going to adjust the reflectivity. So if we drop it to black, there's no reflection. 
it slide it all the way right to white, then it's 100% reflective. Uh, so usually there's kind of a happy medium with most of the shaders you're setting up uh, with, between these two extremes. Um, shininess. Uh, shininess is a slider that appears on a lot of different surfaces, and basically it works in combination with reflection. So first of all, there has to be some level of reflection in order for shininess to work. So, you know, it has to be probably at least 25% or higher reflection value in order for you to really start noticing the shine. And so what the shine does, if the slider is all the way up, it's going to give you a crystal clear, sharp, high gloss sort of reflection. If it's dropped all the way down, it's going to give you a very uh, low luster uh, finish, a flat finish, a matte surface um, uh, that's just going to be sort of um, uh, kind of a blurry shine. You know what I mean? So that's that's what that shiner, shininess uh, slider does. Usually water is going to be pretty high shine and you're going to show the reflection pretty well. Now the Fresnel <coughs> transition is uh, uh, kind of a, an added way to get control over special types of surfaces like water or glass. So in this case with the water, if we drop the slider down, uh, then it becomes almost a mirror-like surface with very little visibility through the water surface. And as we slide this up toward the right, uh, it starts to become less reflective and you start to be able to see into the water surface more and see what's behind the water and into the depths of the water. So that's what that does. And again, like most things, you want to find, depending on the type of water surface you're setting up, you want to find some kind of happy uh, medium there that uh, is going to give this. You know, a lot of things in Artlantis are really done by feel. Now, you can dial in certain numbers, but I think it's better just to kind of eyeball it and, and uh, go from there. So water surface is the other unique uh, feature to the water, uh, frontal water shader. So first we want to adjust the flatness. Right now, perfectly flat, flat you're not going to see any waves, but if we slide that up, then you're going to start to see some, we're adding basically height to the wave surfaces in the water, waves or ripples. They're not waves like ocean waves, they're more like pond waves or, or pool waves uh, when we're talking about waves. And then the wave size would be um, how big these are kind of looking from top down. So bump it out to 10 feet, then the distance between the ripples would be about 10 feet wide. Uh, so you kind of dial up something that seems appropriate for your kind of uh, size uh, water surface feature there. Animation parameters, you can turn that on if you're going to, if you plan to do an animation, and then when this thing animates in our Atlanta studio, you're going to see the water rippling. It's just a very low-key, nice ripple effect that makes it look like, you know, there's a gentle breeze blowing the water. You can dial that up. If there's a little more of a breeze, uh, it doesn't affect the still image, but it definitely does affect the animation if you create an animation. Uh, or we could dial it down to slow the, the ripple speed down a little bit. So that is the, uh, <coughs> in a nutshell, what the water surface uh, can do for you. Uh, we are, uh, looks like we're going to be running out of time pretty soon, so let me jump straight into the uh, how to create a shader, uh, because that's pretty important to know. Um, and that's kind of, I think, one of the key things to really getting great looking renderings is to be able to customize and know what you're doing when you're customizing the shaders. So um, when you start to create a shader, uh, <clears throat> you have to start with something. So if I just started to create a shader, now I'm going to go on the tools menu and create shader from. What's it creating a shader from? It's creating a shader from whatever you have selected at the moment. So I'm going to work on this pool deck here so I don't want the water uh, surface to be selected. And really, I probably actually don't even want this, uh, this deck surface to be selected, although I could use that as the basis for my own custom shader. Uh, I find it's often easier to find, um, if, if I can find one, to find a basic shader that doesn't have any material assignment to it, like maybe this plastic. That's probably a very generic um, default shader. It's just one that hasn't, doesn't have an Artlanta shader applied to it yet, so it's just a basic color. And that's a good place to start. So I'm going to find that. Uh, click, uh, uh, click on it here in the list. Now, of course, I could find it in the model and click on it there as well. But now that I've got it selected, I'm going to create a shader from this. And so it's going to basically have all the settings that were in that shader, but I'm at this point now creating a new shader, which is going to be then applied to this uh, deck surface. But before I do that, I'll tell you one thing I'm going to do. I'm just going to go ahead and drop the basic shader right on the surface. So we're going to start with a clean slate here. And then I'm going to create the shader from that. I think that's, to my way of thinking, a little easier way to think about this. So I'll give this a name, Shader Pool Deck. And um, so uh, shaders 
good quality shaders start with good quality textures. There's no way of getting around that. You've got to know your way around textures. And that goes a little above and beyond the scope of what we have time for today. But I'll, I'll just tell you, I've taken the time to go through and take a, a good quality texture, create a good quality texture, and then create some image maps based off that. So you normally you're going to start with a color bitmap. This is a you know, floor deck we're going to use. And then in the program, like uh, let's say Photoshop, you can take that and manipulate it to make it black and white, uh, play with the contrast a little bit so you're getting more of a, a black and white view where you've got uh, exaggerated blacks for the gaps between the boards or the spaces and then really bright whites for the, uh, the actual wood surface themselves. So that's going to make a really good bump map for Atlantis. So the black surfaces, if we die, depending on how we dial it up for the bump map, uh, will uh, be handled by the lighting as recessed, and then the light surfaces are going to be handled by the lighting, again, depending on how we adjust the slider, will be handled as ray surfaces. So that's um, uh, something you can do in Photoshop. You can also create um, a shininess map, which would basically take certain areas of the shader and highlight them. So those would, when the light hits those areas, it's going to, it's going to light up. It's going to, be, it's going to have be high gloss. And then there are other areas that will be more dull, depending on the darkness in that scene. So uh, you know, if you wanted to create, for example, the appearance of a, a, a rain-soaked surface, that might be a way to do it. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, also you can create um, uh, a normal map. Uh, I won't get into this, it's a complex thing, um, but normal maps basically give some three-dimensionality to the surfaces in Atlantis when the light hits them, that they do some interesting things uh, in terms of reflecting off those uh, normal surfaces. And then it's usually a good idea also to create a preview image of your shader. I'll just pull up a quick slide here, which talks about shaders and uh, so you want to, if you're creating your own shader from scratch, definitely be aware of how it's going to tile across the scene. Make sure your seams are seamless. You don't see an obvious edge. You want to make sure the, the surface is roughly even in color tone across the shader so you don't get a bunch of obnoxious repeating patterns as the thing scales across your, your model. Um, and then uh, just to, again, to recap on the types of um, uh, textures you're going to be creating uh, diffuse map which handles the color, the overall general appearance. Preview image is going to be helpful when you're navigating in the catalog. Bump map, shine, shininess map, and normal, normal map. So these are some tools, some third-party tools you might find uh, NVIDIA makes a textures tools thing that you can use to create normal maps. There's other applications like Indu, Normal Mapper, Crazy Bump. I'm just mentioning those here so if you watch this webinar later you can look those up or you can just do a Google search and find them that way too. It's pretty easy to find this sort of stuff. Um, so back into our Atlantis. Um, we have, uh, we're ready to now start um, creating the shader uh, or applying our um, uh, uh, textures to the shaders. And Kevin, keep me, keep me on track with time because I know we're starting to get uh, close to... Uh, you know what, Chris? I was just going to respond to James' question. Yeah, and I'm just going to say that we might go over okay. a little bit of time, uh, but it's fine. We want to answer as many mm -hmm. of the technical questions from the attendees as possible. So, uh, cool. yeah, Great. just a heads up. So is there a question right now? Um, well, there's plenty of questions. Um, let's see. Uh, no, I guess you'll... Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's probably best to proceed. I'll, I'll take one right now and, and then... Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, you proceed with the presentation? Okay. How about this one? Okay, this is from Anastas. Uh, okay, what is a go good ahead. practice to make good use of those different maps to make better looking gaps or displacements in Atlantis? Well, I, I think using the normal map in combination with the bump map is uh, going to be critical for uh, creating some dimensionality to the surface. For example, if you have a stone surface or a brick surface, a kind of surface that's typically very textured, uh, you're going to be counting on uh, the bump map a lot, the normal, the normal map to a certain extent. You're going to see that. You're going to see this in action here in just a second. So let me just answer it by doing it. So we're going to set up this uh, shader, and uh, we're going to drop the diffuse map, which is the color map, onto the diffuse box here. You can also double-click these boxes and navigate through your hard drive that way as well and find out where these uh, textures are. Uh, but rather than do that, I'm just going to drag and drop. I like quick and easy. In Atlantis, makes drag and drop very easy. 
drop the uh, preview on here. So the preview basically is just it's a smaller uh, smaller size of the same diffuse map image to show a little more detail. So as you're browsing through the shader catalog in our Atlantis, you can actually pick up a, visually a little more of the texture of that surface. Uh, otherwise, it might be a little too tiny for you to really read that on those tiny thumbnails in the, in the uh, catalog. I'll drop the normal map on here, and I'm going to drop the shininess map, and I'll drop the bump map. And so we're just going to quickly go through some of the sliders and what they do. So obviously, for the diffuse map, this is your uh, the tile, uh, the width of one tile. And you can see that the diffuse map is doing it, working its magic, and it's uh, already giving the appearance of this floor deck here. Uh, but if we type in a new value, you should see uh, that scale up. Um, we could go really big if we wanted to, and uh, you know, bump it way up. Um, and then you want it like if the uh, thumbnail preview is basically a half, uh, one, or let's say one quarter of the diffuse map, then you want to you know, scale that accordingly. So you know, four feet wide. Um, shininess map again, again, if we want to play with that, we can. Uh, now we have to have some reflection in order to see the shine. So if I bump up the reflection a little bit, drop the shine down quite a bit because you don't normally see a high glass high-gloss deck surface um, that might look slippery around a pool. Um, but you might give it a little bit of a, a dull shine. Um, and then the bump map, uh, why don't we zoom in to this uh, image here and get a little closer look at the effects of the bump map, what that can do. Now right now the bump map is applied, but it, it's not doing anything yet. So we need to adjust the slider for that to start having an effect on the surface. So if I jack it all the way up, then that's going to kind of maximize the amount of depth that um, these recessed areas, the black areas of the bump map, are going to create. And I could reverse that effect by sliding it in the opposite direction past this midpoint. So I could actually make, uh, you know, invert that relationship. Uh, and if I want to reset it to zero, I can either drag it, eyeball it, or I can click on this little button, and that'll center it right up back to a neutral position. So I'll give it a little bit of bump here, or a lot. And then the normal, normal does some really weird and cool things. With the wood map, it just sort of uh, uh, gives uh, uh, a little bit of punch to the wood grain. So it really makes it appear like it's got some real uh, kind of rough cut uh, appearance to it. Uh, it does some really cool things with floor tile. If you have a good normal texture for floor tile, it can actually make the floor tiles look like they are slightly not level, so each tile has a little bit of a t its own tilt to it, so when it reflects um, uh, things you know, uh, that are in the background off of it, you actually see the difference, you know, uh, the, the, the reflections don't connect between the tiles, they're actually offset a little bit, it's really cool. Um, so this is our shader, let's go ahead and uh, give it a name, I thought I did that already, but maybe I uh, lost it, so wood deck. And um, if we want to add the, fres the, the Fresnel effect, we can, and that just would add the slider to this material. Now, I don't really think it's appropriate for what we're talking about here. It would be more appropriate for a shiny surface like a glass or metal. Um, but I'll go ahead and say this is a shader. Um, I'm going to just stick it in the shaders folder. And I think I created earlier today a, my own folder in here, so I'll just uh, put it in there. And I'll call that wood deck and save it. And now that surface, uh, that, that shader is applied to this material, and it exists now in the family of shaders in our shaders catalog. If I navigate into that special folder, I set up the shader folder. You'll see that, I click on it. So there's our wood deck, complete with the preview image that we had set up, um, all ready to go and to be used both in this project and all future projects, um, you know, because this is now saved as a permanent part of my library. Uh, or at least as long as I keep it there. Um, okay, so that's how uh, shaders are created. And uh, let's see what else I have time to talk about here. We, I think we are pretty much running out of time. Um, let me just see if there's anything else I can mention that might be uh, important to this specific issue. Um, okay, I'll just very briefly touch on a couple of the... Um, 
other uh, types of uh, shaders in our Atlantis that, that do some pretty interesting things. So I'll just take a minute or two to do that. So let's jump to this window um, view here. And we're going to navigate back into our A surface folder and look for the um, frontal glazing material. I'm going to drop that onto that surface. That is now applied. You can see the reflection show up instantly in the preview window. Uh, the transparency, we want it to be fairly transparent. The reflection, we want it to be fairly high. Uh, where we can play with this is in the uh, frontal transition. So if we want like a, 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 you know, a low-E glass so with a high reflective surface or some kind of film or coating on it, then we could drop this frontal transition way down and achieve that effect with this, um, with this shader. Uh, or if we want to see more of what's in the background, we might um, bump up the frontal transition to, uh, you know, to see into the space. Depends on what's important to us. Uh, the glazing quality, um, you can uh, do some interesting things with that. Let me, drop, let me turn up the reflection a little bit so you can see what's going on here. With the distortion size, you can introduce distortion into the glass uh, that almost kind of creates, like the water, it creates sort of a ripple effect on the, on the glass surface. And again, we have to bump up the flatness in order to be able to, to detect that. Um, and you can start to see how the, the, uh, the clouds and stuff are, are getting kind of wavy and warped compared to a perfectly flat surface. So that's the, the comparison there. And you can also check this box for it to automatically de detect window panes in the, uh, in the window surface. So you can really do some cool stuff, especially if you're dealing with curtain wall type uh, situations in your, in your designs. Um, and then let me just, uh, as a final point here, uh, jump into, uh, no, I'll tell you what, we'll do this real fast, this will take a second. Uh, the diffuse Fresnel shader, if I can locate that quickly enough, is a great new shader in Artlantis 4 that is particularly suited to automotive uh, type finishes. And as soon as my screen refreshes, uh, it gives you that frontal transition slider so you can really dial up or dial down the reflectivity. You can almost get a chrome-like effect if you want to really trick out your vehicle. Or you can uh, kind of subdue that effect if you want and, and uh, you could almost make the car uh, you know, lose all of its uh, high gloss sheen if you want to. So you can just find something that, that works for you. But it's a much improved way of dealing with automotive paint surfaces. Let me jump into this last view here, the reapply. That's another improvement in Artlantis 4, uh, which is definitely worth mentioning. So um, let me just jump into um, one of our wall tiling surfaces, for example. Um, and uh, we will, uh, if we need to get down and, you know, if, the, uh, the, if breaking up by the mesh doesn't work, what you can do is actually select surfaces in Artlantis. Uh, it's a little dif difficult to see with this really bright texture. Let me, let me just go in here and knock the color down a little bit. Darken it up. Okay, we should be able to read this better. So we can select individual surfaces. Now there's, you have a, different modes of selection. So we can select by uh, parallel uh, planes or by individual planes. We can select by actual individual polygons. We can select by connected. Uh, planes, we can select by material, so on and so forth. For this, I'm going to select the individual planes and it's going to grab them as I click on them and highlight them so I can see as I'm selecting uh, what is selected in the preview window, which makes it pretty handy. Now, I can't accidentally select a different kind of material, so I'm clicking on here, but nothing's happening because it's not this type of material to begin with. So when you do reapply materials, it has to be of a one specific material only. So um, once I'm happy with my selection, let me go ahead and uh, find a material to assign to this. Um, we'll just pick one, uh, this plastic. And that becomes the basis for our new material that's going to happen here. So we click on this Apply Material button. We have some options here. These are, this is the new stuff in Artlands 4. We can choose from any of the materials that are in the model already. Uh, and right now it's set the, to the default front color. So that's what it's going to use as the basis, that generic sort of brown color. Uh, and we have an option to either create a copy of that material or apply that actual material to these surfaces. So I'm going to go ahead and create a copy of this material. 
Brown to and click OK. And it'll tell you that action cannot be undone, although you can actually go through and um, uh, reapply the material if you need to. Now, if I notice that I, uh, I didn't quite grab everything in that material, like I missed that little top portion. Let me just go back here. If I zoom in, I missed the top portion of that knee wall. It's hard to see until you get really close. So like I said, you can grab that surface. And now that it's selected, I'll jump back. And you can see it's all highlighted there on that little top portion. And then I can reapply the material, select the brown too. And this time I'll apply that actual material that I just created rather than a copy. And click OK and click yes. Now that entire surface has been changed to this new material. And if, you know, Artlantis is a fluid environment, so if I want to change it to something else, I can just drag and drop any new shader I want onto that surface. So uh, that is a real quick and dirty overview of shaders in Artlantis. I know I went pretty fast, but it, you know, I ran out of time so quickly, it seems. So, uh, uh, you know, I want to thank you for your attention uh, today. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, let me just kind of close things out by uh, going back into here and showing some uh, renderings done by some of the people who have submitted uh, renderings in the Artlantis user gallery on artlantis.com. Some really nice, I think, showcase pieces for materials in Artlantis in the use of shaders. Uh, so I'd be happy now to start uh, fielding any questions. Uh, Kevin, point them out to me, and I'll, you know, I'll take them one by one. Gotcha. So we're going to go back to 1107. This is from Carlos. Um, I, he wants to know if you can make realistic renders like 3D, 3D Studio Max using SketchUp and Arlantis. Uh, yes. Uh, well, first of all, Arlantis is a photorealistic rendering uh, software package, but it's not hyper-realistic. Uh, and that's why we partnered uh, with Next Limit Technologies to add um, Maxwell, the Maxwell Render Engine as an option in Artlantis. So if, if I go into this, um, uh, go backwards here, uh, I know one of these renderings for sure is... Um, Definitely this one right here, right? Yeah, uh, let's see if I can zoom this out a little bit. It's not this, I don't, I don't know if it's this one or not. Um, let me go back a little bit if I can, maybe not. Well, it was the picture of the radio. Maybe I can find it a different way um, to show you. Um, but yeah, I mean, the bottom line is the answer is yes, you can do this. And um, it is uh, it, this guy. Nicholas Rivera is a, is a, a master uh, at uh, rendering with our Atlantis. And I'll just show you this whole series of images. I'll just kind of flip through them. And you can see the, the quality that's, that's possible with the um, Maxwell Render plugin. Uh, you probably can't see this too well on your end, but you know it's it's doing everything that Maxwell can do. It's giving the sort of the film grain effect uh, to these images to where they they almost look like photographs. It's 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 uh, it's, it's pretty pretty nice. <laughs> so, yeah, good. Art Mask <laughs> can definitely rival rival uh, uh, you know a lot of these higher end packages. And do it, uh, you can actually end up spending, I think, less money doing it. So uh, it's a good way to go. The combination of Artlantis and Maxwell Render is a pretty hot combination because you've got a very quick, fluid environment to set up your model, uh, that being Artlantis. Then you just switch to the uh, Maxwell Render Engine. You apply some of those specialized Maxwell shaders to some of the metal surfaces and glass surfaces, and you're good to go. So you don't have to spend a bunch of time tooling up the rendering for you know your 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 money shot that you're going to present to the client or that you're going to go out to use funding, um, you can just set it up in Artlantis, and then when it comes time to, to you know, pull out the big uh, the showstopper, just uh, set up those Maxwell shaders and, uh, and go into the uh, Maxwell render engine. Cool. Okay, here's one from James. Uh, he, uh, he wanted to know what are the limitations in Artlantis if a texture is pulled in from the web? Uh, do you lose any feature-rich operations if you apply your own texture? Thanks, James. Uh, I guess it sort of depends on what you what you mean by texture. Uh, you know, if you start with um, uh, something like this, just this map, 
then you are basically tasked with the responsibility of creating these additional um, other maps, like the the uh, the bump map and the shininess map and the normal map and so on and so forth. And you know, definitely for the normals, um, you're going to need a special tool to do that, uh, like the NVIDIA uh, tool, which is a, basically it's a plugin for Photoshop. So Google uh, uh, the NVIDIA uh, texture tool, uh, and you know that's an easy way. And that's Windows only. There are some Mac and Windows uh, specific uh, uh, solutions for handling normals, but uh, it'll make light work with this kind of thing. Uh, so you kind of have to, uh, you got to get your feet, you got to jump in, you got to see how these things behave. Um, but yeah, you can take, you basically start with nothing or nothing more than just a, even a photograph of an image, and with a little work you can get it looking looking right. Um, but you can also, I mean, there are, you know, for example, Dosh Design, they're huge. I mean, they they have all kinds of 3D models and, and textures available. So they've they've done a lot of the hard work in setting up some great looking textures with a lot of these um, uh, type, different types of maps ready to go. So you just put them in, you go into the uh, create shader um, interface and just start dropping them on there. So, I mean, that's super easy. That's, that's, a, that's a good way to do it. So, no, you don't necessarily lose it. Now, you may lose some things. There are, there are some other kinds of maps uh, that may not exist in Artlantis. Uh, so, yeah, you may lose some things in the translation. So, you know, I guess that kind of depends on what you're talking about. Um, this could be pretty technical, but this is from Roderick, and he wants to know, um, we've had a lot of problems with uh, swimming pools in particular. Uh, if in the modeler, the solid element, um, parentheses, slab for the water actually touches the walls around it, then Arlantis shows a black surface when rendered. Uh, we've been doing a workaround, which is leaving the water short of the walls and floors of the pool by about one centimeter in order to not have the black surface. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions? So this could uh, be long and yeah. Yeah, it, it, that is a technical question uh, for sure and it's something that, uh, I mean it's good to have a question like that because that's the kind of question that really needs to go to Advent's Support Center and that incidentally uh, is on the Artlandis website artlandis.com website, under um, support, you jump into the support center. That's definitely the kind of question they should hear about because it's it's something that Artlandis shouldn't be doing, but it is doing. So they need to address it and either tell you how to get around that issue, or you found one way to get around it, but they need to tell you what to do to make that not happen, or they need to acknowledge that it's an issue that needs to be fixed in a future update of Artlandis. So that's a good question. I would encourage you to, if you don't have an account on artlandis.com, go ahead and create one and submit a support ticket. Also under the community, they do have uh, a forum, and there's a lot of activity about technical re related questions in there too. It's moderated by my good friend Ildiko, right here with the heart-shaped glasses. And uh, uh, so there's a lot of good technical information going around in there as well. So those are two great ways on the artlandis.com website to get answers. Uh, also, call your local reseller. Uh, I get a lot of phone calls from people in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, if it's a quick thing I can answer that I know the answer to, I'll, I'll you know, do my best to do that. Um, but if it is something more technical, like what you're talking about that could potentially be a bug, uh, that needs to be reported really ideally to the support center and uh, you know, work through that channel to get your answer and then, uh, you know, that's, that's the way to do it. Cool. So, Roderick, um, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, so, afterwards, we'll forward these questions to Chris as well, and we'll try to answer them through the blog. But like Chris said, if uh, it's a very technical question, it might be best to get a support ticket from uh, our Atlantis' own website there as well. Uh, moving on, let's see. Uh, Merrick wants to know, is there a, a simple way to make the default shader to look more natural? Uh, I mean, imperfect, wary, or grayed out. So, yeah, natural, definitely. Uh, can you clarify what you mean by the default shader? Are we talking about the, um, I don't know if he means just generically the, the shaders that are included with Artlantis or if he means specifically like this basic shader. Uh, can't, he can't mean the basic shader because it, it is a pretty generic um, uh, material to start with. If you want things to look more natural, uh, you know, like some of the things I was showing you here, uh, wherever that slideshow went, uh, from Nicholas Rivera. Uh, if you want to achieve this level, you have really just got to put the time into um, uh, learning how these different types of maps work. To get to 
this sort of level where you're actually reading, uh, hopefully you can see that on your screen, reading little uh, imperfections in that metal surface of that radio, that's all done with textures. Now you can stack um, in Artlanis, uh, you can stack multiple uh, bitmaps onto any material that's defined in here. So I could uh, pancake a whole series of different um, uh, textures onto a, a surface. Let me see if I can give you a quick example. Um, uh, well, heck, I'll just, uh, well, I'll, I'll drop the normal map onto here. You can drag and drop it right on the scene. Now, if you start messing around with that, um, you can, you know, if it were more of an appropriate texture, like let's say a, a coffee spill or something like that with a, uh, 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 a mask created around the coffee spill to outline the, the perimeter of it, uh, you'll see that that now shows up in this texture. That's that image I just dropped on there, and I can go in and manipulate that image. Um, I could force that to be part of the bump map. I could adjust the bump, um, and now whatever bump is, or whatever, the, it's going to read basically the, the light and dark values of that texture and apply that as bump. Now, if I turn the, make it transparent, then all you're going to read from that is the bump uh, that's coming from the light and dark values of that, um, that image I applied there. You can see that it's reading through on this wood surface. So that's kind of the key. The secret is uh, layering textures to provide, you know, if you're really getting in and close up to something and it's really important, uh, that's part of the secret to achieving uh, this sort of level of exquisite detail that Nicholas Rivera is accomplishing on some of his renderings. Um, he has to get in there and get into that minute, minute level and really, really work it for everything it's worth. But yes, you can do it. You just have to put the time in. There's no, there are, <laughs> Artland is a fast tool, but there are no shortcuts to getting results. You do have to put the time into set, setting up the materials properly. Okay, Sabina has this question. Uh, Chris, can you show us how to use light uh, on interior at night views? Thank you. Uh, is that possible? Uh, yeah, I can do that, but uh, I think that's probably a topic for another presentation. We'll do a, you know, something about lighting and that sort of thing a little bit later on. Cool. We might have to work with you to create that next topic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. All right. I got one last one. Okay. This is from Richard. So this is for old users. Okay. So, uh, you know, I was an Atlantis user for many years and missed the uh, latest upgrade path. Uh, in 4.1, can we reuse all the shaders that we have for the past versions, volume 1 to 10? Uh, by volume 1 to 10, I think he's referring to the uh, shaders that were, uh, I think, last. Uh, well, let's talk about Artlanis' history for just a second. Artlanis, uh, went, uh, when it, it, it's, I think, about a 25-year-old product, maybe a little older than that. Uh, it went up to version 4.5 in roughly around 2004, that kind of time frame. Then they completely rewrote the code for Artlanis and released Artlanis R in 2005. It was a complete rewrite. They restarted the version number at version 1. The following year they came out with Artlanis Studio, so they split out the animation capabilities of Artlanis so that Artlanis R, or render, does the still images, Artlanis Studio does still images, plus the um, animation features. So since the new version 1 and up through, I believe still, version 4.1, you can use the legacy Artlantis shaders, volumes 1 through 10, uh, if they were published uh, in year 2000 or later. So anything from 2000 through 2004, if the shader on the disk you have has a copyright date of 2000 or later, it should work. Uh, definitely should work through, I think, at least through Artlantis 3. It may not work with Artlantis 4. I haven't tested that, so that's a good question. I don't know. Maybe you've tried it and it didn't work. I'm not sure. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, it's been uh, close to 10 years now, and things just eventually drop away. I mean, I haven't provided that legacy support for those shaders, but, you know, of course, there comes a time when uh, all those things have to go away. You know, they can't keep supporting those things forever. Um, so, uh, you know, eventually those things are going to stop working. Um, but, you know, if you like some of those uh, old shaders and 
you can get in there and, and access the original bitmap files that were used for those shaders, well, guess what? <laughs> you can use what you learned today and create new shaders using those old bitmaps if you want. So not everything is lost. Of course, it would take some time, so you probably only want to create, you know, recreate your, your favorite shaders if, if and when Artlantis no longer actually supports those, those shaders. Cool. Okay, uh, let's do one last question, and then we'll close off the presentation, uh, the Q&A session. Uh, Eric wants to know, is Arlantis 4 and Arlantis Studio separate applications that need to be purchased separately? Uh, well, I, I kind of uh, mentioned that in the last question. Uh, the difference between, uh, there's two, two uh, flavors of Arlantis, let's say. I'm not going to say versions, two flavors. Uh, one is Arlantis Render, which does the still images, and one is Arlantis Studio which does the still images plus the animations. So if you don't do a lot of animation work or you're not sure whether you're going to need that, uh, that uh, capability, you can start off with Render, uh, which uh, retail on that is about $750. Um, and uh, you can work through that. And if you ever reach a point where you need to create your own animation, then you can basically upgrade to Studio for roughly about the difference in cost between Studio and Render, so you aren't losing money. You don't have to completely rebuy the software. You just it's a, there's an upgrade, discounted upgrade path. Um, so that you know, Render versus Studio, one does still images, one does animations. Now version four, that's different. Now versions of Artlantis were you know, we 2005 was version one. A couple years later, there was version two. Version 3 came out a few years ago, and then version 4 came out, uh, I think, maybe two years ago. Uh, this year is probably going to be the year we see a new version. Um, so uh, I don't have really any information uh, other than it's, it's probably happening um, at this point in time. But um, So uh, that's you know the, the difference in version. When that happens, uh, when version 4 comes out, uh, and you're on version 3, then it becomes uh, an, an upgrade situation where you're having to pay to get from version 3 to version 4. Now, there is a discount. Uh, if you own anything from version 1 up to version 3 right now, you're all eligible for a discounted upgrade to ArtNanus version 4. If you're on the old legacy ArtNanus, like version 4.5, the old 10-year-old or older version of ArtNanus, uh, you would be looking at paying full price to get into ArtNanus, the current version of ArtNanus, which is 4. Good questions. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for all those questions. Yeah, so I just want to remind you guys that uh, if we did not get to your question, um, um, we're gonna what we're going to do is we're going to forward the rest of them, format it, and then send it out to Chris uh, and see if we can answer all these questions as well. I know there was a question about rendering. I think that might take a little bit. But, uh, yeah, if uh, Chris, if you want to render that and send it over, we don't mind posting it at our NoVeg blog as well. Cool. All right, we'll talk after the... Uh We'll talk. We'll definitely we'll keep in and, touch. And, uh, and we'll cover that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I'll switch back to me as the presenter right now. Okay. Let's see. Let me know if you guys see my slides here. Hello. I see it. Cool. Awesome. So on behalf of the Novich team, Chris, thank you. On behalf of the attendees, well, to the attendees, thank you for attending. Uh, this is a really informative uh, Advent Arlantis uh, webinar. Uh, so if you want to learn more about the product, uh, I know Chris mentioned some of the support tickets, at the community, the online community, if you have any technical questions, head on over to Artlantis' website. Uh, as you can tell, there's a wealth of information and there's also plugins and uh, Artlantis Studio videos as well. Check out the media, check out what they have to offer. Do head on over there. And if you're thinking about purchasing a version, Artlantis Studio 4.1 for Windows or Mac, uh, head on over to our website at NoVeg.com. As one of the largest online design software stores, we offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of this Atlantis Studio, uh, it is available from us uh, in both Canada and the United States uh, as a digital delivery with sale, zero sales tax. So if you're interested in picking up a copy of Atlantis Studio 4.1, contact our sales representative, Bob Bayer. Uh, he can be reached at by email through Bob at Bob at Novich.com. There you go. Now, also, we have a, Novich has an online community called VectorWorking.com. It is for uh, architects, landscape, and lighting designers. Um, if you want to talk about Arlantis, uh, this is definitely the place to get um, 
open BIM news, anything about architecture, landscape related. So head on over there and when you sign up, you get a free weekly newsletter uh, covering all of the latest events and job opportunities as well. Uh, follow us on Twitter as well. Like and subscribe and join in the conversation. Um, as I said, we'll have questions from this webinar for Chris. And if you want to see a Q&A, uh, we'll make a blog post at uh, blog.novich.com. And this is our company blog as well. If you want to learn more, uh, well, if you want to learn more about Rhino 5.0, we have 100% uh, independent Maya of Design Rhino, uh, who will be moving to LA soon. Uh, she is a designer by trade and also an instructor as well. So if you want to learn more about Rhino 5 and its capabilities to design and create, uh, head on over, find more details at our webinar page at novage.com forward slash webinar forward slash 70. And if you have any questions, comments, or looking to give us feedback on how we can improve uh, this service offered to you guys, the attendees, uh, send me an email, send me a question at kevin at novage.com. And if you missed something, today's webinar is was recorded, so if you want to check out this and if you miss something head on over to vimeo.com forward slash no veg or youtube.com forward slash no veg like and subscribe support us uh, if this is something that you like do that thanks now thank you for joining us today Chris do you have any last words for the attendees here well just once again thank you very much for attending I appreciate your attention I appreciate the questions and uh, by all means reach out to us reach out to no veg uh, we're here to help we're here to uh, show you, you know, what Artlantis can really do for you to, to you know, um, streamline the way that you create rendering so uh, by all means reach out to us we're happy to help you yeah. on your your journey to uh, success with Artlantis gotcha thank you Thank, thank you, Chris. This was a great webinar, and thank you, everybody, who joined us today. Yes, thank you, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Aurora. I appreciate it very much. It's all good. And attendees, please do not be shy. Have a discussion with us. All right? We'll talk to you later. Have a good one. Um, have a good evening. Bye. Take care.